Welcome to Municipal Affairs, a groundbreaking new show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. We're excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Today on the show, we turn to the first use of the strong mayor powers in Ontario to pass a building permit in the town of Ajax. Then we'll be heading to Saskatchewan, where at recording, 76 rural municipalities have declared a state of agricultural disaster and what the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities are looking for from the province and the federal governments about this issue. Then we're going to be joined by Councillor Mike Pashik of the Summer Village of Half Moon Bay. Councillor Pashik is on the forefront of the resolution that he put forward to be debated at the upcoming Alberta Municipalities Conference regarding the use of golf carts on municipal roads. And then finally, we will be diving into the recent cabinet shuffle in Ontario. But first, in Ajax, Ontario, Mayor Sean Collier has taken what he calls bold action by utilizing his newly acquired strong mayor powers to greenlight two proposed 60-story towers in the town's major transit area. These proposed projects have been stalled in the planning stages for the past two years, according to Collier. I'll be introducing two bylaws tonight under the authority of Section 284-11-1 of the Municipal Act, also known as strong mayor powers. This section of the Act gives some heads of council the power to propose bylaws to their councils if those bylaws advance a prescribed provincial priority. This is not the first directive that I've initiated since Section 284.11.1 was passed. In July, after July 1st, when these powers came into, into place, I delegated my powers to determine the organizational structure and hire and dismiss staff below the department head level to the CAO. I delegated my powers to establish and dissolve committees, assign chairs, and duties to those committees back to council as a whole. And I issued a direction to staff instructing them to begin the process of preparing the budget in accordance with our past processes. These bylaws tonight are just a further extension. In the historic move, Mayor Collier became the first mayor in the Durham region to harness these expanded powers, which now allow the mayor to secure bylaw approvals with just one third of the council votes, as opposed to the traditional requirement of a majority. I understand this is new. I understand this is different. I I understand that, that some people, myself especially, are more comfortable with change and, and, you know, maybe getting outside my comfort zone than others. I get that. I also understand that this has been pretty passionate for some people. Um, all of us on council know very well, whenever we have uh, something new, an infill project or something come along, we know people are going to come out against it. Always. Because people are sometimes adverse to change. But once these things go ahead, we also know that generally a lot of the what ifs and, and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and doesn't really happen. The use of the strong mayor powers took place on September 5th with Collier saying that the town needed to take action on the housing crisis in the province and in Ajax, where it is far behind their municipal counterparts. Now, I'm not suggesting that heights and densities such as I'm proposing today would be appropriate across our town. Major transit station areas, or MTSA, were established around GO stations with increased density targets for people and jobs. It's also expected that development in these MTSAs would be transit-oriented development and that less people would require cars. This is the perfect location, in my opinion, for these high-density projects. We just need to look two kilometers to our west to see 55 and 57-story projects under construction right now in Pickering. Ajax has a significant higher, significantly higher population than our neighbours, so I see this as a suitable height in our MTSAs. On February 6 of this year, this council approved a pledge to build 17,000 new homes in Ajax by 2031. This was a target provided to us by the province, and we're off to a very slow start. There was an article put out by CBC on July 26 of this year And of the 29 fastest growing municipalities in this province, Ajax is dead last. We can't say we have a housing crisis and sign a pledge 
and then turn down a development that will produce exactly what we've been asking for. He admitted that the use of the new powers bestowed upon municipality mayors in the province may be controversial, but he didn't want to leave decisions best suited for Ajax in the unelected hands of officials in Ontario. In my opinion, the development of 190 West New Road South for approximately 1,274 residential units advances the provincial priorities laid out by the province in that regulation. Some will ask, why use strong mayor powers to move this forward? Why not just let it go through the normal planning process? The developers of 190 West New Road South made their original application for an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment in December of 2021. This matter was scheduled to be considered by council in June at the request of the developer. And my understanding was that this would not be supported by this council and would end up at the Ontario Land Tribunal or the OLT. I strongly oppose turning over the decision-making power from the councillors that were elected in Ajax to a group of non-elected people outside of Ajax to make our decisions for us. For this reason, I chose to proceed with this direction. Collier ended up getting a majority anyway on the two proposed bylaws with a vote passing by four to three. Now, an update from last week by-election news. On September 6, with a total of 268 votes cast in Penhold, Alberta, by-election, Cameron Gillespie has secured a position on council, taking over from former councillor Mike Walsh. While Gillespie achieved 118 votes, it was significantly ahead of his closest competitor, Rob Burton, who secured 60 votes. Brandon Pringle followed with 47 votes, Mike Dodman with 32, and Samantha Miller with 11, respectively. And on September 7th, voters in Tabor, Alberta, elected Daniel Ramford as their newest councillor for the Southern Alberta community. In total, 714 votes were cast in the community, with Remford grabbing 214 of those. And his nearest competitor, Dale Tillman, secured 179 votes. Naomi Wibb followed in third place with 121 votes, while Cat Champagne garnered 95 votes. Manny Pahar secured 86 votes. And Mike Kerhank, 79, with Ian Croft coming in last with only 13 votes. Both newly elected councillors are expected to be sworn in sometime later this week. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross-Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. 76 rural municipalities in the province of Saskatchewan have recently over the summer declared a state of agricultural disaster. Now, the reason for this declaration is a severe drought that has taken a relentless hold on the agricultural regions of Saskatchewan, particularly in the southwest. This is a matter of utmost concern for the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, who recognize the urgent need for immediate action to alleviate the devastating consequences of the prolonged dry spell. The affected areas encompass several municipalities and agricultural communities, all grappling with below average precipitation levels that have persisted for an extended period of time. These conditions have led to the depletion of water supplies, part soil, and most importantly, substantial hardships for the farmers and ranchers who rely on adequate moisture for both crop production and livestock grazing. Ray Orb, president of SARM, in a one-on-one -on -one interview with us, sheds light on the extent of the disaster, the challenges faced by rural communities, and the path forward towards recovery. And most importantly, we talk about what the federal and provincial governments should be doing and are doing to help farmers and ranchers in the province of Saskatchewan. 
Ray, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. Um, as of uh, Wednesday, September 6, 76 members of SARM have declared an agricultural disaster in the province of Saskatchewan. Now, uh, I, I just need a little bit of context here because I, I'm not sure if this is unusual or if this is higher than normal. But for SARM, is this sort of typical at this state of the year in September for 76 members to come together and declare this type of an emergency? No, oh, it's certainly not typical, but um, I believe it's uh, probably not out of the ordinary considering the uh, the conditions that are out there. And I'm speaking, you know, of the dry conditions, especially in the southwest, uh, west central, you know, the west set part of the province. Uh, some of those communities have received... Uh, you know, virtually none, and it, it's a, uh, it's a bit of an issue too. And I think it's a little harder to understand this year because we have some RMs. You know, they might have had some rain in parts of the RMs, and um, maybe they had you know thirty percent of, of normal, or maybe even forty percent of normal. But other places in the same RM I didn't had any rain, and so it's really um, I it, I think it's a bit harder this year to uh, to uh, to actually. Uh, uh, state where the defined area is but as time goes on and we get more rms that declared a disaster we have a pretty good idea and the federal government also has a uh, a drought uh, monitor and they're monitoring the situation as well so we got a pretty good idea now where the drought is and it's actually expanding so the uh, the rural councillors the reeves and the uh, council members uh, those those are the people that live in in the RMs, and so they have a better handle on it than anybody else. So they're looking, and they can see that uh, you know that uh, our producers, the farmers, and the ranchers are under a lot of stress. They're just not getting the rain that they needed this year, and uh, it's it's an economic hurt. I think is more of an issue than anything else. Uh, they see them struggling. Uh, they're kind of the trigger. Uh, for uh, for some federal programs is around 50% of normal of precipitation. Now, some of those areas would be fall way below that on, on average for each RM. So that kind of triggers them to uh, take a serious look at it. Some have declared disaster early on, and these are this is a um, a natural disaster. Keep in mind, it's not a, it's not man-made or anything like that. But uh, it's uh, it's falling below that 50% threshold is is why they're uh, raising the alarm it, is this normal uh tr traditionally saskatchewan is known as sort of a prairie province and it's a sort of uh less precipitation throughout the year are you seeing and i know you are the reeve of your rm as well but are you seeing less precipitation in the area as in your part of the woods because while you're not in the south uh, western part of the province you are close to those members as well yeah, we're not seeing that uh, reduction as much. We've had some fairly good rain in my uh, RM, RM of Cupar, and our, you know our crops and our and our pasture, uh, you know, is indicative, uh, you know, of showing that this year we have we have some pretty good crops. But we don't have to go very far to the west of us, and we can see that uh, you know the crops are not as good. Uh, pastures and not as good. The hay crops are not as good either. So uh, it, this drought actually takes up a fairly large part of the province. If you look at the map itself, and we have a good interactive map on the SARM website right now that you can you can have a look at. I, I, I certainly did, and that's what I that's why I wanted to reach out and talk about this. Um, you, as the president of SARM, are probably in conversation with a lot of the Reeves and councillors who make up a lot of these southwestern RMs who have declared these state of agriculture disasters. Um, I, I just want to know from SARM's perspective, what role does SARM play in co uh, coordinating conversations with the federal and provincial government to ensure these issues are addressed, but also that all <laughs> RMs are being on the same page when trying to uh, get funding for their cattle, uh, for their ranchers and their f uh, farmers? Well, I think our role is, you know, it's really a support role. We support these uh, these RMs who are our members of ours, of course, um, you know, lobbying for, for programs. In this case, we're lobbying for uh, a program that will uh, allow the federal government and the province to put some money in. And we haven't seen the federal government... Uh, uh, look at uh, uh, helping with this program other than this rainfall insurance program. I know Minister McCauley uh, was part of the announcement 
so that so it is cost shared. But uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, the agri recovery program is something that the province of Saskatchewan already has indicated the eighty dollars per head for livestock. The federal government has not matched that. So because we are a lobby group, we're planning to go to Ottawa next month. And uh, we have Minister McCauley on the list of ministers to be able to sit down and be able to talk. So I'm sure uh, we know Minister McCauley, he knows us. When we show him this map, I think we want to we want to kind of bring that to his attention that something needs to be done to help the province. So really, it's a support role more than anything. Uh, our our division directors are probably more in contact with local RMs than I myself, but I do get called from time to time. Uh, that goes on pretty much around you know around the year. Uh, but this uh, this season is the time you know we have to keep in mind as well. Many of those producers are out there trying to salvage hay, and they're probably not going to be apt to pick up the phone as much uh, to contact us. But definitely, uh, we are concerned about the the whole uh, situation. So you did just talk about the Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporation for its rainfall insurance program. Uh, the federal and provincial governments did come out uh, saying that producers will see help in the amount of potentially up to $60.4 million. While this is probably good news for farmers and ranchers and even RM uh, municipalities across Saskatchewan, uh, you talk about how the federal government needs to come to the table and help out a little bit more and match the funding for heads of cattle. What else can the federal and provincial governments be doing today to help out farmers in southwestern uh, Saskatchewan who are dealing with this ongoing drought? Well, I, I know that the uh, the provinces, you know, they're looking at agri stability, and uh, there is a way to uh, fast track um, payments through agri stability, and that would be through either advanced uh, payments or else. Uh, in the case that some farmers are uh, are actually done harvest, they'd be able to put in a claim. Uh, the issue with this is that program is actually based on last year's income. So that um, that idea of an advance would have to be carefully done. And I think you know, the federal government is able to do that now. Egg recovery, I think, is the thing that we're looking at most of all because of the fact that uh, it's uh, it's a kind of a program that could be could be pushed through really quickly. So if you recall, in 2021, there was a payment of $200 a head. And that uh, that included, uh, uh, you know, beef cattle as well. So the cost share was uh, eighty dollars from the province and one hundred and twenty from the federal government, and that's what we're asking for. And I know the province is asking for that now. It's a very quick uh, uh, turnaround for that program because I be I believe the assessment has been done. Uh, the federal government has a drought map, so they can see where the shortage is uh, for rainfall. And uh, you know, as the as the claims come in through crop insurance, uh, that information will be. Uh, will be fed through the federal government as well. I think there can be some changes. You know, agri-stability is something that we hear a lot about, not really helping the livestock sector. And if you if you know how it works, the margin coverage um, is there. But if your margins keep dropping as you keep claiming uh, and things don't go well in your farm, then you're, you're actually your farm isn't protected as much because you don't have the, the margin there. And I, I'm, I know that the federal government, the province have been looking at making some changes, but uh, at the same time, we have a new uh, five-year program that we just entered into. So I don't see any big changes there, unfortunately. There have been coverage level changes, which have been good. And the province pushed for those, uh, those margin levels, which, uh, which I think is good, and, uh, and some other changes as well. But uh, we rely on crop insurance. Uh, the livestock producers do the ones that are that are signed up for the rainfall insurance. Uh, you know they have uh, they have some coverage for forage as well. Uh, but in times like this, uh, you know uh, I think it just ag recovery really needs to be addressed, and uh, the sooner the later. You talk about how SARM is going to be heading off to Ottawa here this month to go talk to some ministers in the federal government. Um, Saskatchewan farmers and uh, ranchers aren't the only farmers and ranchers across this province who are uh, dealing with this ongoing drought is particularly here in Alberta. We're seeing southeastern Alberta being hit with the exact same drought. 
are you working in partnership and collaboration with your sister organizations, RMA, with the M AMM from Manitoba to sort of address these issues? Or are you doing this alone? And I'm just asking this off the cuff mm -hmm. because I think it's an important message, message that needs to be asked. Yeah, we actually, uh, we had a uh, conversation at a meeting yesterday, uh, but it was actually uh, an FCM meeting. It was due I think dealing more with uh, with rural municipalities, but we did we did talk about the drought and and the the kind of the dire situation. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, the RMA and us and the MM are really concerned about food security right now more than anything because you know uh, we realize that Canada has a really a, a powerful role to play. Not you know the prairie provinces have that role, I should say, uh, as well, producing the majority of the uh, the grain crops and uh, and the beef cattle as well, and so not only feeding our nation but um, uh, but feeding our foreign customers. So and we're concerned, you know, whenever the federal government comes up with uh, some new uh, regulations, perhaps uh, okay, carbon tax is one example. We just spoke of that yesterday. Um, the carbon tax is increasing. Clean fuel standard, what we see as a like a second carbon tax. Uh, why why is the federal government imposing these uh, added expenses onto uh, farmers at a time when we should be concerned about producing the grain? You know, uh, so uh, that's another thing that we're going to be trying to address in our meetings this fall. Uh, we didn't have such good luck last year. We tried to meet with Minister Jobo, the federal environment minister. However, he is on the uh, on the list again, and we're really hoping we can get in there. We just think the federal government should should have not increased. Uh, the carbon tax anymore just should have kept it as it is. We understand that's something that the federal government wants in place for now, but we just don't think that they should be increasing it. So that's kind of our perspective of uh, how our three organizations are working together, as well as some other issues, as, too. I want to turn back locally here because your rural municipalities uh, or association, SARM, and the rural municipalities who are on the front lines of this drought of this agricultural disaster are probably trying to figure out how they can help in the short term, their cattles and farmers. What are you as president, what is SARM telling the rural municipalities to do in the short term until the federal government comes back to the table, until the province decides to do more to help out their farmers and ranchers? Because as much as you have to wait for them, you have to make uh, helping decisions now to sort of help the farmers through this challenging time. What are you telling your members and what is SARM telling their members to do in the short term? Or are you hearing what they're doing in the short term? Well, for now, we're we're advising them uh, <laughs> to uh, to really monitor the situation and if they see fit to occur the disaster. So I think declaring the disaster uh, that also triggers uh, the federal government looking at that uh, breeding herd tax deferral. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. So producers should be able to uh, to utilize that. And I know the federal government is uh, is looking at that for this entire drought area. Uh, keeping in touch with SARM, letting us know, of course, um, you know, there, there's not a, there's not a lot more. I don't think I really don't think we can do right now other than trying to get that hands into the money. Uh, sorry, trying to get that money into the hands of producers. Some of that money that the province is already allocating will help uh, uh, producers, you know, be able to uh, bring in feed, you know, to keep their, their cattle going. Uh, we're concerned as well that there might be a larger sell off of the beef cattle herd. I think that, that's something that Alberta is concerned about too. Really, it's just to make farmers aware that they should be able to work uh, with, uh, with producers, uh, you know, neighbors. Uh, there is a criteria in some of the crop insurance here in Saskatchewan. Uh, where the uh, producers, if they have an adjuster come out, they, they may write that crop off a little sooner. They've actually doubled that low appraisal yield. And so to make that available to livestock producers, you know, their neighbors perhaps that have livestock, uh, that will help. But to, just to make sure that they are aware of those kind of programs, and we do work with some crop insurance, and we send a, a lot of information out through the RMs to make sure that they're aware of that too. Uh, beyond that, I think we're just going to have to wait a few more weeks. I'm sure we're going to get some more rural municipalities that declare disaster, but uh, it's an unfortunate situation. Uh, we're still hoping, like everyone else, is for some good moisture this fall. That would drastically turn things around, but the forecast does not look 
uh, very good for the for the short term or the medium term on that on that front. I, I'm going to ask a very odd question right now, Ray, but I think I you're up for it because I think I need to know what's what's the number because we're at 76 now. Two weeks ago, we were at 69 municip- rural municipalities who had declared a state mm-hmm. of uh, local agriculture disaster. Where, when does this stop? Is it just going to continue to grow until we do see that rainfall? Could we see in the over 100 rural municipalities potentially declare or are you hoping that we don't get there? I'm hoping that we don't get there, but I would not be surprised at all if we reach 100 uh, because there has been very little rainfall lately. Uh, you know, keeping in mind we're at, we're almost at the end of the season because, uh, you know, producers are harvesting. That's one thing. But uh, the uh, ranchers that have their cattle in the pasture, you know, they've been rotating as much as they can, but they're now running into the issue where they have pastures that haven't been used and have no grass in them. So some of them be looking at, uh, you know, removing those cattle and unfortunately maybe selling calves earlier this year and at the same time maybe selling some of their, their breeding herd. So it wouldn't surprise me to get 100 because it's been moving up quite uh uh, quite uh, quickly over the last two to three weeks. And uh, I'm really fortunate, you know, that our SARM staff uh, lets me know if there's a new one each day. And some of the arms send them directly to me to make sure that I see it first before uh, it goes into the uh, you know, provincial government. And then, of course, the federal government sees that as well. So give me hope here. Give me some, give me a silver lining here, Ray, to give me some sense that. While we're in a bad, the part some rural municipalities and some farmers and cattle ranchers are in bad spots. There is a light at the at this end of the tunnel. Well, I would like to think there's a light at the end of the tunnel uh, for some producers. You know, they've been telling us they are in the f- uh, sixth or seventh year of drought. Uh, you know, and we we've, historically, you know, we looking back at some of the records, and you can go back quite a long time. Um, you know. A drought that lasted 10 years was not uncommon in this province. If you look what happened in the 1930s, realizing farming practices were a lot different then, but there basically wasn't much rain from 1930 to uh, 1940. And of course, uh, uh, there was one year, I believe it was 1933, that was a complete, utter disaster. A lot of things uh, went south that year. So it's a, it's a much not much solace there, but uh, you know we're always looking to the skies. You know there is uh, you know a new weather pattern now. We're getting into that uh, El Nino cycle again, and I was just reading some information about that this morning. It looks like according to Environment Canada that that's a drier uh, kind of forecast for the winter, and I believe warmer temperatures. However, the Farmer's Almanac right now disagrees with that. They say, no, there's more snow and uh, and cooler winter. So who do you believe? I, I just like to believe uh, that it's going to turn around and we could see it this fall. Uh, our weather is a bit more, I would say, erratic in the sense that, uh, you know, just when you don't think it could get any better, it turns around quite suddenly and you wonder why, why did you worry? But there's a lot of worry out there, unfortunately, and I really feel for the for the ranchers, uh, uh, the farmers and their families as well, and hoping that it does turn around as well. In a significant development, Toronto City Council has given the green light to the updated long-term financial plan alongside a range of actions aimed at tackling the city's ongoing financial turmoil. This crisis, as outlined in the 2023 Financial Update and Outlook report earlier this year, is both immediate and long-term, with staggering figures. An estimated $1.5 billion pressure for the 2024 operating budget and a whopping $29.5 billion needed for the 10-year capital plan, contributing to a massive $46.5 billion shortfall over the next decade for the city. However, 
It is important to note that even with the actions approved last week, Toronto urgently requires immediate and sustained support from both the government of Canada and the provincial government, according to the city of Toronto. In response, the council has formally requested the authorization of new revenue tools that can adapt to the city's unique needs, including possibilities such as a municipal sales tax on goods and services or a share of existing sales taxes. What does the city do? It's at the core of this conversation. When you have any problems, any local residents, who do they call? If they're in trouble, they call 911. If they want service, 311. And if your wonderful daughter was pregnant and about to have a kid and, and need childcare. Who do they call? They call a childcare center funded, managed by the city of Toronto. You want to get a book, library services. You want clean streets. You want safety, police. Wow, the kind of work we're involved with is every aspect of the daily lives of our local residents. We need to see it as a blessing. And today, because I, came, I went to the uh, uh, Hanukkah, uh, advanced Hanukkah celebration, to talk about blessings, it's about sweetness. This is a blessing. We are blessed as city council, myself as the mayor, to be in charge of all these services that are so essential and crucial to the lives of everyday residents. Wow. And what else did we do today? We said thank you to two staff that put in 10, 11 years of their lives and did so much work for us. We're proud of their work. They've won awards, whether it's about empathy, it's about service with respect and kindness. That's the kind of service we provide to the people that we serve. And the people that are at the core of the service, they deliver this service with kindness and respect. We heard it today. So there's a choice tonight. We could be proud of what we do, come together and speak with one voice and say, yeah, we'll take the hard role, we'll be, it's tough, saying that we're going to charge more on this and that, we, uh, but it won't impact on ordinary people. It's really going to be people that have a bit more. We're going to ask for some staff report. Let's do that. Okay. Those are things that we have the power to control. We'll do it. We'll do it together. The financial crisis is a pressing concern for Toronto, and the City Council is taking multiple steps in the short and long term to address this crisis. Among the immediate steps taken by Council is directing staff to implement graduated municipal land transfer tax rates for high-value residential properties starting January 1st, 2024. They're also exploring a multi-year approach for property tax rates and removing the on-street parking rate cap to enable a comprehensive rate review. Additionally, a report will be generated on the possibility of increasing the vacant home tax rate from 1% to 3%. The Toronto Transit Commission is being urged to also collaborate with the city and the Toronto Arts Council to boost ridership. Looking ahead, the council is considering the introduction of a new revenue and policy tools as well, such as a foreign buyer land transfer tax, a commercial parking levy, a dedicated 911 next generation levy, and emissions performance charge for buildings and so much more. These measures aim to address the financial crisis that the city is under. Council has also communicated its concerns to the provincial government, urging them to address issues related to the long-term care, transit projects, and the maintenance of key infrastructure like the Gardner Expressway and the Don Valley Parkway. Toronto is at a critical juncture in its financial stability, and the decisions made in the coming months will have far-reaching implications for the city and its residents. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most. 
in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. As the countdown to the Alberta Municipalities Conference scheduled for later this month quickens its pace, municipal leaders throughout the province are gearing up for a momentous gathering that promises to be a pivotal juncture in shaping the future of local governance. Amidst the bustling halls of the conference venue, one resolution in particular has captured the spotlight and sparked a spirited debate. The proposal of the use of golf carts on designated municipal roads. Now, to provide a deeper understanding of this noteworthy resolution and its potential ramifications, we had the privilege of engaging in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a key figure at the forefront of this discussion, Councillor Mike Pashik, representing the summer village of Half Moon Bay and holding the prestigious position of President of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta. In this exclusive interview, Councillor Pashik shares his insights on this proposal. Mike, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I want to start with this resolution that the uh, Summer Village of uh, Half Moon Bay, I was going to call it Moon Half Bay, but it's Half Moon Bay in Alberta that they're putting forward at the Alberta Municipalities Conference later this month in Edmonton. Where did this resolution come from about allowing the use of golf carts on municipal roads? Well, you know, and, and thanks for your interest in, in our, our resolution from our, our tiny little uh, summer village on Sylvan Lake. Um, you know, it, it started as a bigger question. Uh, not only am I a counselor with the summer village of uh, Half Moon Bay, uh, but I'm also president of the Association of Summer Villages of Alberta. And so that gives me a much broader scope as to what's going on uh, within summer villages uh, in Alberta. And uh, we have a board, and one of our board members came to a meeting a couple of months ago and said, you know, uh, he's been trying to uh, influence Alberta transportation to make changes to the rules to allow golf carts. Uh, he wasn't getting anywhere with his conversation, so our association, uh, uh, ASVA, to shorten it up, uh, decided that we'd jump in and help. And uh, as we started to research the issue, we found that uh, other jurisdictions had already allowed it to happen. And uh, this summer village, the you know, and the mayor of uh, Whispering Hills uh, didn't have the capacity to write the resolution. And so the ASVA stepped in and uh, we did our research, wrote the resolution. So it's really come from uh, a number uh, of summer villages and, and even some other villages and towns that are looking for change to the uh, Traffic Safety Act. So what would this mean? What would it mean to for summer villages, smaller communities, or even larger communities to have the ability to allow golf carts? Because when you think of golf carts in the way that the world is right now with electronic scooters, with a lot of new electronic uh, sort of uh, uh, apparatuses, and I want to use that word correctly here, yeah. what would it mean for communities like Half Moon Bay, like Whispering Hills, for a residents to have the ability to drive their own golf carts on uh, their municipal roads? Well, you know, it, it, it's just another form uh, of alternative transportation. It allows the members of those communities uh, a different opportunity to stay connected. And when we looked around at what the other provinces were saying, it was all about uh, keeping people connected in their communities. And it's it's this um, ability inclusive, I'll use that term. And so it, in other jurisdictions, they've talked about how seniors can stay connected, how those that have mobility issues can stay connected to their community. And, you know, if I just use an example of for summer villages, it allows those those people and, and, and able-bodied people as well to get down to the parks, 
to the beach areas, you know, to participate in community events and continue to be part of the community. And, and so we think that, you know, it's, it's a low cost solution. It's a low carbon solution. And, and it is right in line with what uh, other larger centers are doing with the e-scooters. And, and, but it's just a golf cart. And today golf carts uh, are not allowed on Alberta roads. And we hope that uh, the Alberta government uh, sees fit to make a change and to allow uh, that to happen. Now, the thing I'd say is that we're not looking for this to be a broad brush solution. What we want is, um, and what we're looking for, is that municipalities choose for themselves whether to implement the rules or not. We know that somebody like Calgary does not want golf carts going down Deerfoot Trail. But at the summer village of Half Moon Bay, we want to allow our residents access to the beach to get out on our roads and their their low speed roads and then move through uh, our trail system to get to our parks and our and our beaches so you know it, it's not going to be for everybody and and uh, you could see that we had you know the town of Delburn a second emotion and because they see some value in their community uh, for allowing it to happen and and so it's it's not just the smallest summer village, but it it is other communities, towns, villages that I believe will adopt this uh, a resolution as well. Now, you, in the resolution, you're asking for the provincial government to amend the Transportation Act to allow municipalities to allow municipal uh, golf carts on municipal roads. Now, unfortunately, and I, 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 I apologize for asking this question, but I think I need to ask it. Uh, not all municipalities have 100% of their roads in their community owned by the municipality. Some butt up against highways. What insurances would you give the province when they do amend this that someone in their golf course is, cart isn't just going to go drive on uh, the side of a highway, the provincial highway or a federal highway to get to a beach, like you said, because not everyone's butt up right against a beach. Right. Well, and, and it's not just to get to the beach. It might be to get. Uh, I'm just using your concert. analogy. Yeah. yeah. But but perhaps it's to get to the senior set or or, yeah. or something like that. But what prevents them, you know, a municipality has to look at the roads that are within their jurisdiction. Yeah. And I would say that uh, they need to look at roads that are low speed roads, like 30 kilometers an hour and, and something where a golf cart uh, can operate safely and uh, in conjunction with uh, other motor vehicles. Of, of things like that. Um, I, I'd say if, if, if a golf cart decides to go on Deerfoot Trail, you know, I, I don't think we can give that assurance to the government that that'll never happen because I can't, I can't, I can't believe that you happens. can get, give them assurance that it won't happen right now, even without this policy passed. But, but I, you I, know, just, just to uh, pick up on that, what you said there, um, in some ways, asking for this change uh, so that municipalities can choose for themselves uh, would enable uh, golf carts to be legal. They're already being used. And so let's put some parameter up, parameters around what's the safe use for them and, and uh, rules uh, for their use and just make them legal where they're already being used. You earlier on, you talked about how British Columbia, Ontario, and even in the um, a resolution that's in the Alberta municipalities package, Saskatchewan have moved into either adopting this policy or even uh, doing test pilots of this policy into municipalities. Now, when crafting this uh, resolution to be presented or later this month at the Alberta Municipal Conference, did you speak to other municipalities across Canada to see what the best practices are what they've gone through during the the transition to allowing these golf carts on the uh, uh, municipally designated roads you know uh, i did have an opportunity to speak uh with uh, a president of association similar to our 
Summer Village Association in Saskatchewan. And we did talk about the types of rules that Saskatchewan wanted to put in place to make sure that uh, golf carts operated safely, that those operating them were protected. And um, so, so we, we kind of understand where the various governments are going to go and what kind of rules, safety rules, uh, they should uh, uh, make before the, these golf carts can become legal. Um, so we do have a sense. Uh, I, I would say that in Ontario and BC, they did a great job uh, where I didn't have to talk to anybody. All the information was online. And so we saw what rules they're contemplating in there. And many golf carts already comply with those rules. And so it should be an easy transition here in Alberta. Now, besides talking to other municipalities from across the country, you probably have had discussions with municipalities here in the province of Alberta as well to talk about what their interest of this is, because you are hoping that this will be passed at the conference and then Alberta municipalities will take it up and sort of advocate or uh, talk to the provincial government. Are you having discussions with your counterparts across the province to see what their interest of even entertaining this idea was about before pu putting this motion forward? Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, I'm also fortunate enough to sit on the board at uh, Alberta municipalities. And so around that board table is great representation from all different types of municipalities uh, in Alberta. And we had the conversation at that board table and um, the other members all supported the resolution because it it wasn't a broad brush. It was municipal specific. You could make your own decisions for your own municipality, and then, and so then outside of that that board setting, uh, once the resolution came out, I've been getting emails where saying, uh, "Is there a petition set up that we can help?" help sign or sign and help you uh, advocate to the government for change. And so uh, much like you reached out, many other municipalities are reaching out and wondering if there's a petition to sign. And of course, my, my feedback to them is, well, let's just wait and see how uh, Alberta municipalities and their members uh, move to advocate for this. And, uh, and if they choose not to, and that's their choice, the members might think that this is too uh, uh, far reaching uh, and it might make changes that they're not willing to have in their municipality. But if they're not, then we'll look to other means to advocate uh, uh, for th this change, whether we use the Association of Summer Villages, whether we use a petition. Um, but right now, we're hoping that uh, Alberta municipalities and their members uh, will help us lobby for uh, change. While that is going on, I'm assuming, and I, I know you should never assume, but I'm going to guess that you've had conversations with someone within the province to even see if this is feasible to move forward on this, passing a resolution, and then seeing if the government would take this up. Have you had conversations with, if I'm not mistaken, you say you're uh, in the Sylvan Lake area, so your MLA is the Minister of Economic Corridors, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Devin Drieschen, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Well, well he's um, uh, transportation. Transportation. Yes, that's right. I forgot. So, so he's he's this this is perfect. Firmly for him. firmly in the crosshairs. I know. No. So have um, you had conversations with anyone from the province? Because when you're at the conference, because it's gonna be one of those you get up, you uh present your speech of why you believe you should be in favor of it. Some people may say, has the federal or the provincial government even been approached by this beforehand? So in that answer, what would you say? Have they been approached and are they willing to entertainment if the prov if the municipal Alberta municipalities do pass a resolution like this? You know, uh, we have not approached uh, the government on making changes to this. We're try we are trying to just move through uh, a, a different process. Let's let's get uh, Alberta municipalities on board with the need for change, use their strength, their capacity for advocacy work, 
and and let them or help us uh, to make change. If that doesn't work, as you said, I will see go and see Minister Dreeshen uh, right after the conference, and actually we'll probably see him at the conference, and perhaps we'll we'll have that short conversation uh, uh, in one of the hospitality suites. Who knows? Um, I, I want to end on this and I want to let you sort of just uh, sort of give your elevator pitch. Why is this important? Why should municipalities in Alberta uh, vote in favor of this resolution? Because I, I, to me, it seems like a no brainer, but there might be some people who are still on the fence. So why should people vote for uh resolution? I want to make sure I get this right. C4. C4. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I'd start off by saying that, Many other jurisdictions have recognized the value of allowing golf carts to operate on municipal roads. And in doing so, they see the value of providing an alternative mode of transportation, you know, a mode that's like e-scooters or other, other uh, types of personal transportation like this. It's, it's a low carbon, low cost, safe, um, uh, ability inclusive alternative mode of transportation, one uh, that will help uh, residents stay connected in their communities. And I think that's that's probably my 30 second pitch right there. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's always a great pleasure to talk to people who are engaged, but also to talk about issues that are important to municipalities. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for having us and thanks for your interest in our topic. In a move towards increased collaboration and efficiency, both the City of Brantford, Ontario and the County of Brant, Ontario have unanimously endorsed the reestablishment of the Joint City-County Shared Services Committee during their respective Committee of the Whole meetings last week. The new committee, composed of 10 members, with five from the County of Brant Council and five representing each of the Brantford City Council's wards, will be tasked with exploring opportunities for service sharing and improvements, ultimately providing recommendations to both councils for consideration. The Joint City-County Shared Services Committee was originally formed in March of 2017 and was responsible for examining various service sharing opportunities, ranging from emergency measures to transportation strategies, parks, healthcare, and other areas of shared concerns. During its previous tenure, the committee successfully made several recommendations, including the formation of a joint master plan implementation working group and the allocation of funds to undertake a regional transit solution. With its reestablishment, there is great potential for further collaboration between the two municipal organizations. This includes leveraging opportunities for administrative efficiencies, animal control, organic management, housing transit, transportation, climate action, and airport development, among other things. The committee's revival aligns with the shared goal of optimizing and maximizing resources while managing property tax increases and addressing the ever-growing demand for services. By working together, Brantford and the County of Brant aim to create a new and innovative service that enhance the resident's experience and tackle existing and future challenges. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Premier Doug Ford announced a cabinet shuffle in the wake of the resignation of Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister Steve Clark last week. Clark's resignation followed mounting criticism over his ministry's handling of the Greenbelt land swaps. In a news release, Ford named Paul Calandra as Clark's replacement. Calandra, who had previously held the position of Ministry of Long-Term Care, will now take on the critical role of overseeing municipal affairs and housing in Ontario. Yesterday, I announced changes to our cabinet. This team, these ministers, they're the right team. 
who will never stop working to build Ontario. They're the right team to get it done. I want to congratulate ministers taking on new portfolios and welcome members of caucus who are new to the cabinet table. As Minister of Long-Term Care, Minister Calandra has been hard at work for residents and their families. Under his leadership, shovels are in the ground to build new long-term care homes across Ontario, with new homes for over 10,000 seniors currently under construction. Ontario is on track to be the first province in Canada to deliver an average of four hours of resident care per day as we bring on thousands of new nurses and personal support workers. For the first time, we're bringing diagnostic services to residents rather than disrupting and moving them to appointments. It's clear Minister Calandra has a proven record of delivering on tough assignments. He has a proven record of getting it done. He's going to bring this same get it done approach to municipal affairs and housing as he takes on the housing supply crisis, the biggest challenge facing governments in Canada. We need a wartime effort to build more homes. We've made so much progress. After decades of stagnation, we're finally seeing the results of our plan. 2022 and 2021 had the most housing starts in 30 years. And there were more rental starts last year than we've seen in decades. But as Canada and Ontario continues to grow at a record pace, we need to do more. And I have every confidence that Minister Calandra will deliver. This change in leadership comes amid mounting controversy surrounding the handling of the Greenbelt land swaps by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Critics have urged and argued that the government's approach to these land swaps has raised concerns about environmental conservation and urban sprawl. Uh, by sincerely thanking uh, Steve Clark for the work that he uh, has done uh, at the ministry uh, before uh, my uh, uh, being becoming uh, the minister, I know some of the work that he's done in helping uh, tackle the Housing Supply Action Plan has really helped uh, put us on a track uh, to building more homes faster. In fact, as the Premier stated yesterday, we've seen more uh, home starts, uh, new home starts over the last uh, two years than we had seen in 30 years. So I want to thank uh, him very, very much for that. He will, of course, continue to be a very, very important member of, uh, of the team in the caucus uh, uh, going forward and somebody whose, uh, whose advice I've always valued uh, uh, a lot. I also uh, uh, want to, uh, to thank the Premier. I want to thank the Premier and my caucus uh, colleagues uh, for the, the faith and the trust that they are putting in me uh, to become the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It is obvious that uh, it is uh, a very important time uh, and it is a very important commitment that we've made to build 1.5 million homes across the province of Ontario uh, by 2031. It is something that the Premier has reiterated to me uh, before I took the, uh, uh, the job. Um, but he also said to me uh, that it is important that all of the work that we do is done in a manner that maintains uh, the public trust. The new Minister of Municipal Affairs, Paul Calandra's appointment, signals a shift in government's approach to the housing policy. The Premier's decision to place him at the helm of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing reflects a commitment to addressing the provincial housing crisis, which has been a growing concern among residents in the province. Now, with the Greenbelt issue still a topic of debate, all eyes will be on the new minister as he navigates the challenging terrain. The public will be watching closely to see how the government proceeds with the housing and land management policies under his leadership. And that's all for Municipal Affairs for this beautiful Monday, September 11th, 2023. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to all of you who have tuned in and watched or have downloaded and listened. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please keep those stories coming. Share your municipal news, concerns, and triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.